welcome to our PTTT talk number 12. I'm happy to be here today with our uh, speaker Ines Pereira from University Université Clermont Ferrand. And Silvia Volanti and Mariana Madeira will be hosting the talk with me. Uh, we are the Petrochronics, a research and extension group from Brazil that have a series of collaborators around the world. And uh, we are promoting this series of talk uh, to promote the, the subjects related to pet chronology and cell dynamics. And we are very happy to have you today. Thank you, Ines, for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. So welcome to our PTT talk. I will, be, I, I will be a brief presentation about Ines Pereira. She is currently a postdoc at, Le at Laboratory Ma Magmas and Volcanoes in France, but she started her geology studies in Lisbon in 2006. She, she graduated in 2010 and enrolled in MSc in Evora, Portugal, looking at the exhumation mechanisms of migmatite complex. Her, her PhD started in 2015 in Portsmouth, UK, with Professor Craig, Craig Story to, to develop the application of the trito root ru, ru tie to understand the evolution of the plate tectonics through time. Part of this work is published in the EPSAL papers, published in 2020 and 2021. She is interested in metamorphic geology, petrochronology, se sedimentary pro process, and crustal evolution. This is why she really likes root tile and titanite. So we here we are here again with another talk. Thank you, Ines, for accepting the invitation and, the, and being our speaker today. We are looking forward to your talk. My pleasure. All right. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, Petrochronics folks. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's talk from Dr. Ines Pereira from the University of Clermont-Nouvelle that is titled Rutile and Titanite, the ultimate pair in probing crustal and tectonic processes. So in this talk, Ines will tell us about some of the novel applications using the field of earth sciences to investigate accessory minerals, uh, and in particular, Rutile and Titanite. Um, she will focus on experimental petrology um, and petrological on experimental and petrological investigations to better constrain rutal and titanite stabilities and chemistry. And she will also show us how uh, these accessory phases can be used in prominent studies to better eluc elucidate paleogeography and metamorphic processes of the source areas. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Ines. Thank you, Silvia. <laughs> So, um, as you already uh, said, today I'm going to focus on rutile and titanite and how we can use this amazing mineral pair to probe crustal and uh, tectonic processes. So, uh, I would like to say that this journey has started during my PhD that was led by uh, Craig Story in Portsmouth, UK, and that I've been lucky enough to continue this research now under the guidance of Emily Broin here in France. And so what I'm going to present is a bit of a combination of research that has been going on uh, in the past seven years or so. So because some of you might not be so much into the field of accessory minerals or it's a bit rusty, just so you remember that accessory minerals, they occur in very small quantities in a rock. So often they represent less than 1% volume of a rock. Because these are non-essential minerals, they usually don't contribute to the naming of a rock, uh, such as olivine or quartz, but nonetheless, they are key minerals in unraveling geological processes. I guess the most famous mineral uh, that people know has provided a lot of insight into uh, geochronology. So dating rocks, for instance, has been zircon. But uh, metamorphic petrologies, they have a bunch of other minerals they really like that they provide useful insights such as monazite, titanite, apatite, and lastly, but not less important, rutile. So um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about rutile and titanite today. So where can we find rutile? 
So we can find rutile in either metamorphic rocks, either metapolitic or metamorphic, but also uh, in igneous, usually felsic igneous rocks, and associated with ore mineralizing fluids. And the range of conditions, metamorphic conditions, where you can find rutile is quite uh, wide. So here, just a couple examples of rutile found in either low temperature, high pressure conditions in an ecogite, or at high temperature, low pressure conditions, such as in a granulite. And then here, just a few uh, images that illustrate other uh, types of rutile occurrence. As for titanite, we can also find uh, titanite in metamorphic rocks, again, in both metapolitic and metamorphic rocks. But additionally, it's also quite ubiquitous in metacalcilicate rocks, which is relevant. And then in a wide range or wider range of igneous uh, compositions. So here we can see some titanite grains in a low temperature, uh, high pressure ecogite in Corsica, or uh, where we mostly see titanite in uh, amphibolite, at amphibolite conditions. And then different uh, titanite grains that have been found in different types of igneous rocks. So rutel and titanite are also found in sedimentary detrital rocks. And to my research, this is really relevant. Here, I just want to uh, illustrate a little bit that for instance, here associated with the Congo fan, we can look at the uh, proportion of the different heavy minerals in sediments or sedimentary rocks. But as you can see here, usually the proportion of heavy minerals is quite low. So here is even less than 0.03% uh, of the volume of these rocks. And of course, uh, usually the main heavy minerals found in these sediments are zircon, tourmaline, and rutile, because these are the most resistant to weathering and most resistant to diagenesis. But you can see that titanite can also be uh, commonly found in sedimentary rocks. So here on the right left side, I'm just illustrating this very nice uh, multi-proxy approach led by Zhu et al. in 2020, where they uh, dated all these different uh, heavy minerals uh, in sediments and uh, they tried to reconstruct uh, provenance and the history of the source area. So just very quickly, what's a, our common workflow when we uh, analyze or when we work with uh, rutile titanite accessory minerals? So we rely a lot on microanalysis. So we can all either start by crushing a rock and then separating heavy minerals under a binocular microscope, and then we prepare them in epoxy mounts such as these, or we can uh, directly work in situ in thin or thick sections. Then uh, usually uh, most people, they start with uh, electronic imaging on, in SEM, so due to the interaction of electrons with our sample, we can have different types of information and we can maybe look at texture and already have an idea of different uh, variation in composition in our grains or if there are inclusions. And if we're interested, we can do a more precise quantitative analysis using uh, microprobe microanalysis and then either do a single analysis, such as what's depicted in this diagram, or do uh, elemental mapping. And of course, if we're interested in trace element composi composition and isotopic uh, compositions, we need to do uh, mass spectrometry. So for in situ, usually what is done, we have a laser and we couple a laser to mass spectrometers. And then we can either work with very large sample cells, such as this one or smaller ones. But what matters is that at the end, if we work with either grains or thin sections, we collect data using laser ablation, and then we have to treat that data. So here I just show a UPB session and some rutile reference material analysis. Okay, so for this talk, I thought of discussing a little bit about Rutile and titanite petrochronology, then rutile and titanite phase stabilities, 
which will lead me to uh, discuss a bit um, the metamorphic record through time. Then I'll end uh, discussing uh, the trital rutal and tectonic settings, how we can use the trital rutal, and uh, how occasionally uh, this uh, rutal uh, particularly is disturbed. And I'm going to discuss a case example from the weather formation from Minas Gerais. So, okay. If we're going to now focus a little bit on uh, metamorphic petrology and how we can use rutal and titanite in a petrochronology approach, of course, it does matter where rutal and titanite are found uh, stable. So here in circles are different rocks where rutal has been found and in these little diamonds is where titanite has been found. And so just very uh, quickly, we can see that for a wide range of pressures and temperatures, we can either have one or the other. Perhaps rutal will be prevalent at higher temperatures and much higher pressures than uh, titanite, and titanite will cover uh, lower temperature and blue schist fascist conditions. So these minerals will really inform about uh, partially similar, but also different stages in the PT evolution of a rock terrain. Then we can uh, assess the trace element chemistry of these phases, and they perhaps can elucidate multiple growth generations. So they might grow at the uh, first time, then grow at the second stage as well. And something that is quite relevant is that if we're dealing with different chemistry, with different bulk, this may lead to different reactions. So these minerals will appear at a different time during the evolution of this metamorphic rock. And of course, different metamorphic grades are, lead to different constraints on how we interpret both the trace element and the UPP data that we recover from these phases. So here, um, just this very nice diagram that I um, used from Région Fumes. So we can see that here uh, they constrain the peak with monazite and then cooling with rutile. But depending on the grade we are, maybe rutile is not recording cooling, it can also record peak conditions. So these are important things to uh, keep in mind. Now we can use trace element in both rutile and titanite uh, to do a bunch of different things. Here I'm just giving two examples of uh, different trace elements that were measured in all the different uh, minerals in an assemblage of blue schist, fascist conditions or low temperature eclogite for both Politic and mafic compositions. So this is this was published by Carl Spandler in 2003. Very nice study. And here I just want to focus. So at blue schist fascist conditions in mafic rocks, we see <clears throat> that titanite actually incorporates an uh, important amount of niobium tantalum, but also a bunch of the different heavy uh, heavy rare earth and middle rare earths, and less so of the light rare earth elements. While uh, in politic uh, blue schist rocks, we see that titanite is more important carrier of these uh, rare earth elements and more so again of niobium and tantalum. Now, if we go to rocks where we have rutile, so in eclogite, we see that rutile mostly incorporates niobium and tantalum, also significantly uh, vanadium, a bit of zirconium, hafnium, and then it's not depicted here, but also uh, important uh, amounts of iron. So I guess this is just to illustrate that these minerals, they incorporate a wide range of different trace elements. So it's, uh, it's on our best to try to understand uh, what reactions or what conditions are behind the incorporations of these trace elements to see if we can use them in our benefit. So one of the uh, primary uh, uses of these minerals is to date events, either peak metamorphic conditions, crystallization, cooling ages. And we can do so because here, for instance, I'm showing uh, the uranium concentrations found in individual rutile grains from different uh, high pressure uh, rocks. And we can see that we go from very small amounts of uranium near 0.1, up to 100 ppm. 
And titanite is quite similar. So we see that we can go from close to 0, 0 0.1 up to 100 or 200 ppm uranium. And so these make them uh, datable, but not as easy as zircon. And another reason uh, behind, not just because of a smaller quantity of uranium, is because, and it's well depicted in this diagram here, is that titanite incorporates uh, significant amounts of common lead. So here, these, uh, these circles with different colors and sizes, they represent uh, the fraction of 207 um, that is com the common lead. And we can see that uh, occasionally we have uh, root uh, titanite grains with high proportions of common lead. And this makes dating uh, these minerals, especially if you just rely on one grain, particularly difficult. Then what's behind of uh, what events we date using these minerals it has to do with the lead closure temperature. So the temperature below which lead is no longer mobile. And part of uh, interpretations uh, behind closure temperature of different accessory minerals has uh, been based on the experimental data from Daniel Chevniak. So this one was published in 2000 and is a collation of these different, different minerals and uh, at, depicted at different cooling rates. So either slow or faster cooling rates. And here, this gray bar represents common uh, grain sizes of these minerals. So let's say from 200 uh, microns up to something like 60 microns. And we can see that for both rutile and titanite, at these grain sizes, we're looking at a closure temperature of about 600. Now, we know that uh, for rutile, probably this is the highest uh, closure temperature that we can have. So here I'm showing uh, a compilation of data from experimental and natural uh, observation. While for titanite, uh, it's actually the reverse. So probably 600 is about the minimum uh, value for uh, uh, below which lead is no longer uh, mobile. But uh, some natural data point out that the closure temperature for titanite can actually be as high as near 800 or 750 degrees. <clears throat> so when we get ages from titanite or rutile, they might uh, represent not only different growth episodes, but also different uh, peak conditions. So here are just a few examples of uh, work that has been carried to characterize and uh, uh, provide UPB ages of both rutile and titanite. So here I would just like to uh, illustrate this uh, common lead uh, problem. So here we have the Terawasserberg uh, Concordia diagram, and we can see that uh, a good portion of rutile uh, grains or measurements are near concordant, but there are only some spots that have some common lead. These can be corrected and we end up having a nicely concordant age and the same is true for uh, titanite. The problem being that if you have multiple titanite generations, then you end up having more complex uh, distributions and interpretations. And you need uh, more either petro petrographic or trace element composition to try to discriminate these different titanite generation events. And here, finally, I just would like to show, this is a study I really like from Alan Quidgeman published in 2010, where they nicely demonstrate these traverses across rutile grains that you preserve the uh, oldest ages in the cores. And as you get closer to the rim, you get younger ages. And this is just due to uh, lead diffusion. OK, apart from UPB dating, I would say that uh, geothermometry is uh, one of the main uses uh, for uh, rutile and also titanite in uh, petrochronology studies. Mm. I chose to show for the zirconium in rutile geothermometer the latest calibration published by Matthew Kahn in 2020, where he nicely combined both uh, natural and experimental data 
to try to cover best the low temperature range of the calibration. And here, uh, the well uh, established calibration from Hayden published in 2008. What I would like to draw your attention here is to these equations. So for the zirconium in rutile, uh, we need to estimate the pressure. So we need to have an idea of what sort of pressures, uh, if it's five kilobars or if it's 23 kilobars, it, it does have an impact at, in the temperature estimate that we calculate. Well, um, but we need to uh, somehow be reassured that the activity of uh, quartz and zircon is close to one. While for the titanite zirconium uh, calibration, we can actually estimate, so we can uh, estimate the activity of rutile and quartz, and we add that into the equation as well with pressure to estimate the temperature. And these are two just uh, nice studies. So this one, Emma Art in 2018, she managed by uh, measuring zirconium concentrations in rutiles in both matrix and in the inclusions in other minerals to determine uh, direct evidence of ultra temperature in the Napier complex and then uh, uh, exhumation. And Conan Carey in 2011, they did very nice uh, depth profiling in titanite. And they go from finding these uh, higher temperature and older titanite grains. And as you get deeper, you get to the to younger ages and slightly lower uh, temperatures. So these are uh, there is a wide range of applications and problems that you can solve with these minerals. So next, I'm going to discuss a little bit the phase stabilities. So I already mentioned a little bit where we can find one or the other, but these are actually quite critical for uh, trying to constrain the metamorphic record through time. So I'm going to discuss a little bit more in detail. Um, so a recent uh, work published by uh, Samuel Angibust and Arlov in 2017, they looked at the stability of titanite and rutile in granitoid compositions. And they work with a composition very similar to an average pilite. And they use two calcium compositions. So 1% calcium and 3% calcium. And we can see that this is within the range of uh, pilite pilite uh, compositions for calcium as well. And very briefly, what we can see is that if we have calcium poor lithologies, rutile tends to stabilize at slightly lower pressures than when we have higher calcium compositions, where we will promote titanite stabilization. But regardless of compositions, what we see is that with decreasing temperature, the pressure upon which rutile is stable is higher. And the limit between, so this titanite out reaction, it does change, of course, with this uh, bulk rock composition, but you can see that at 600, it might be as low as uh, 12 kilobars, but at 500, it's already close to 14 kilobars. So these for these uh, granitoid compositions, while for mafic compositions, uh, the um, latest work published by Liu in uh, 98, they just run experiments at about 600 degrees and above. So this side of the PT is more or less well constrained. We kind of know quite well where we have this titanite out or ilmenite out, ilmenite out reaction in transforming into rutile. And Usually this is at close to 13 kilobars, but we know very little at lower temperatures. And this is quite relevant because if we are interested uh, to use a mineral to infer about blue schist fascist conditions or low temperature eclogite con conditions, we need to know uh, if the reaction looks like this or if it looks more like this. So the best that we've had is actually try to uh, use thermodynamic parameters and try to model uh, compositions and see how uh, the titanite out reaction is affected. And 
so just using this uh, modeling from Green et al, uh, quite well known, published in 2016, we can see that as we reach 500 degrees or so, the titanite outreaction changes slope. So part of the work during my postdoc, we've been trying to uh, place experimental constraints on the position of this reaction. So between 600 degrees and lower temperatures. These are quite challenging experiments. Uh, I guess uh, it's obvious that with at low temperatures, it's very difficult to grow things. So we've tried with different um, starting materials. So we use powders that are either ecogite uh, bullcrock powders. We also made a glass from that powder and then we pulverized it to use as just a, a composition glass. And we also used a basalt powder. We had some starting seeds of both the protont and the reactant. So we had uh, titanite and rutile. And uh, later on, we also started adding uh, quercetite uh, to provide a bit extra titanium and calcium. And we use a solution with, that is water and uh, magnesium chloride. So we do a uh, piston cylinder experiments. So we prepare our powders, we put in an inner gold capsule, then in a nickel, nickel oxide uh, outer capsule, we put in the assembly inside this piece, so the cylinder. And on the top and on the bottom, there are two pistons and we uh, push in the pistons to uh, increase the pressure. And we use a thermocouple to um, control the temperature that we wish to run our experiments to. So these are just uh, images of how the uh, experiment looks like when it's done. We can image it in the SEM and even do some uh, compositional mappings to see uh, what minerals we've, we can find in the matrix. And here, these big chunks are titanite seeds. And we can already see some orange uh, composition. So it's a mix of iron and titanium. Uh, they are growing on the edges of these titanite seeds. So I don't want to uh, bother you a lot with all the different results. I just want to have like a nice illustration of different results that we've, we've got so far. So we can either see this uh, core titanite seed that has been overgrown by a fluorine-rich titanite. So this proves that we have titanite growing at these conditions or the reverse, that we have occasionally titanite seeds that show this solution, and we have iron oxide and rutile stable instead. And so these help us constrain um, the stability of either rutile titanite or both at given pressure and temperatures and for different compositions that we uh, have used. So this is a summary of the results that we've got so far. We're not done yet. So B, C, D, they are uh, slightly different starting compositions. B and C, they are mo both using a more ecogite powder with rutile and titanite seeds, while D is the more basalt powder. And so um, what this preliminary uh, data or, or pre preliminary interpretation is, is that when we co compare our experimental results, so when rutile is stable or when ilmenite is stable or titanite is stable, and if we compare with the thermodynamic uh, data and the modeling, it shows that occasionally, such as here, rutile is uh, stable at slightly lower pressures than what the model predicts. And systematically, this is about two, two uh, kilobar below what the model uh, predicts. But still, it's always above 13 kilobars or so between the range of 600 and 400 degrees. And now uh, for the next month, I'm going to focus more in this more basalt powder uh, starting composition. So these are just the three experiments that we're able to look at. And we can already see that at 600 degrees, we have ilmenite stable at about uh, 14 kilobars and 
if we raise it to 16 kilobars, we start having brutal stable as well. But this is again lower pressure than what the model predicts. So hopefully in a few months time, we will be able to really draw strong conclusions about uh, this reaction of either ilmenite and titanite out. And so next I'm going to move on from this and what we learned from this and into try to track the metamorphic uh, record through time. Now, uh, Michael Brown has dedicated probably the last 10, 20, uh, 12 years uh, looking at the distribution of the different, different peak conditions found in different metamorphic terrains all over the world and discriminate them into uh, low, intermediate or high geothermal gradients. So rocks that follow a low geothermal gradient type metamorphism or high. And then if we uh, look at the distribution of these different types of metamorphism through time, across time, so here present and here the Archean, we can start to draw some ideas of the prevalence of either high geothermal gradients or low or cold geothermal gradients uh, through time. So here, mm, this diagram is kind of just a, a sketch uh, of the data. And what we can interpret is that at least since the Archean, both high and intermediate uh, geothermal gradients are found, and they are quite persistent in the geological record. And then it's only at about uh, 1.7 to 2.1 billion years ago that we have the first evidence of high pressure, low temperature metamorphism. Uh, so some uh, ecogite or evidence of ecogitic conditions have been found in the rock record. Then there is pretty much nothing throughout most of uh, the Mesoproterozoic. And then only uh, since the Neoproterozoic, we uh, have again this uh, signal of cold geothermal gradients and of paired metamorphic conditions. And if we specifically look at uh, blue schist fascist conditions, we only really find it in since the late Neoproterozoic. So um, is this a true record? Did we just have something like the start of a uh, cold uh, subduction, but then it failed until it restarted and then it became a continuous process? Or uh, is this record incomplete in some ways? And part of uh, the research uh, community that has been working and thinking about these uh, problems, they base part of this uh, questioning on the fact that if we look at modern um, orogenic belts where we have uh, evidence of this type of uh, cold uh, metamorphism, we see that usually these, the preservation of either of blue schist is, uh, is not very strong, so very easily uh, they retrogress, and usually they are in high mountainous areas. So very quickly in the next 20, 30, 40 million years, these rocks will be eroded. So this has inspired part of my PhD, and now I'm continuing that line of research, to try to come up with ways to look at the trital minerals that may have been eroded from these sort of rocks and belts, and try to uh, investigate if we find evidence of a cold type uh, high pressure metamorphism. So we have to look at the trital rock record. And in order to do so, so now we no longer have the metamorphic rock context, we just have the grain. And so we need to apply a range of these tools that I've already discussed to try to discriminate this rutile in terms of, or titanite, if it's igneous or if it's metamorphic. I guess this is the first approach. We don't want to look at igneous rutile or igneous titanite. We want to focus our attention on metamorphic grains. So different, um, different uh, trace element discrimination diagrams have been proposed in the last five or six years. So here I've just put a few of them. I guess uh, the most well-known is the chromium-niobium discrimination diagram, 
uh, that was initially proposed by Thomas Zeck in 2004 and has been revisited several times after that, where if we have uh, chromium rich, niobium poor, rutile, we have rutile derived from a metamorphic source. And if it's niobium rich, then it's derived probably from a metapolitic source. Uh, myself and my co-authors, we've also tried to look at the I-field strength elements in Rutal and their ratios. So here's Arconium, Afnium, and Niobium Tantalum. And see if there is any variation with the context. And what we found is that usually uh, Rutal that has been formed directly from interaction with fluids or from precipitating from fluids usually yields very low niobium tantalum and zirconium afnium ratios. So plotting on this side of this diagram. And then uh, Aganji has also been dedicating some time to try to understand the distribution of elements such as uh, tin, tungsten, and antimony in rutiles either from metamorphic, granitoid, or associated with gold mineralized rocks to try to discriminate these different types of rutile. Of course, you can see from these diagrams that there is always some overlap. And this is what makes, makes it hard, this sort of approach and work, but it's probably the best we can do. Now, I already discussed a lot about the stability of rutile. When does it kick in? When is it the reaction of titanite out rutile in? And this is quite relevant for what I'm going to talk next. So, as I told you, to use the zirconium in rutile equation, we need to have a pressure estimate. But if you're dealing with the trital minerals, we don't have a good pressure estimate. So, some people, they just assume um, 10 kilobars or 7 kilobars or any uh, given pressure. But to try to... Uh, as best as possible, not induce big errors into possible interpretations about the evolution of peak uh, metamorphic conditions through time, I tried to use these, um, these constraints published by Angie Boost and Arlov. And so I've used for 550 degrees a minimum uh, temperature of 13 or 12, so 13 plus or minus 1 kilobar as the reaction that produces ruta. And so, in this way, in this diagram where we have the different isolines of zirconium uh, concentrations in ruta taken from uh, Matthew Kahn's calibration, here we have the minimum conditions, 550, 13 kilobars, that above which we have ruta. And here I've plotted the minimum conditions or maximum conditions of low TP uh, metamorphism. So below this, we have cold subduction metamorphism. And to the left of the star, we know uh, for sure that we have a rutile that is going to be recording either blue schist metamorphism or low temperature ecogite conditions. So I tried to evaluate if these uh, thresholds would, would be sufficiently robust in case of a reheating event or in, case, or in case of slow cooling conditions of a terrain. And so what these uh, lines, dashed lines here represent are different cooling rates or different time scales of uh, metamorphism at 600 degrees, 650 or 800 de degrees, that would allow resetting of the zirconium concentrations in rutile. And so what we see, and it's intuitive, is that very fast cool rates or very short uh, time scale of reheating events, you can preserve uh, zirconium concentrations in rutile as high as 800 degrees. While if we have a long lasting heating event or very slow cooling uh, conditions, we can reset zirconium concentrations to about 600 degrees. But so this is extreme condition. 
This implies that a grain that provides an estimate of 550 degrees or so is probably a true signal. So what next? Next, I went on to dig up all the detrital rutile data in the literature. And uh, of course, uh, data that provided trace element composition and enough trace elements that I would be able to use different discrimination diagrams to split what's a metamorphic from a magmatic from a fluid related rutile. And by doing so, we reduced this data set to about 700 rutile grains across different ages. So what we have in this diagram, we have the temperature estimated using zirconium concentrations from individual detrital rutile grains calculated at 13 kilobars. And I've split the data between uh, rutile that has from the chromium niobium uh, discrimination diagram, a metapolitic signature from a metamorphic. Because if it's derived from a metapolitic source, we are highly confident that the uh, silic activity and the zircon activity were close to one, while we are not so sure about these activities if it's derived from a metamorphic source. And so looking at the distribution of these uh, peak temperatures recorded by rutile through time, what we see, and if we start so present day, we know that we have a uh, low cold subduction related metamorphism. So here in blue, and if we overlap the temperature estimates by uh, with, the, with those of the trital rutile, we see that we have significant number of grains that correspond to these uh, eclogite or low temperature eclogite uh, conditions. And, the, and therefore, it does tell us that we can use this approach in order to infer the existence of low TP and, of course, intermediate and high TP conditions in the metamorphic record. Then, as we go back in time, we see that there are fewer and fewer uh, detrital rutile grains available during this uh, period, this slice of time. So between somewhere of 700 million years and uh, 1.7 uh, billion years ago. But we see that about 1 to 1.2, we do have a, a tiny excursion to uh, peak temperatures recorded by rutile below uh, 580, 600 degrees and really uh, almost up to 500. And then we have a period of just uh, high or uh, intermediate TP conditions. And then we have to go back to 1.7 to 2.1 to again see again some rutiles that record uh, low TP uh, metamorphic conditions. Now, this data set shows that there is a population of Archean age rutile that is at the limit of what could be already low TP or can still be intermediate TP metamorphic conditions. So this is not uh, obvious to me if this could already represent uh, the initiation of uh, low TP metamorphic conditions or not. But what is certain is that the signal is there at about 2.1 billion years ago. And so this is just a small data set. These are only 700 grains. I'm sure that if we had 3,000, we will just increase the numbers of grains that record these exact same uh, conditions. So just using the detrital rutile and the rock record, what we can say is that similar conditions to nowadays where we see paired metamorphism and cold subduction are recorded at at least 2.1 and perhaps even before in the accretionary origins that had led to this main uh, orogenic event at 2.1. However, and as I shown you before, probably we are missing part of this record just by using the trital rutile because at blue schist fascist conditions, titanite is the most stable phase. 
So we know this when we look at our uh, blue schist rocks and some low temperature ecclesites, we see titanite, we don't see ruta. And so what's next is trying to improve how we can discriminate titanite from igneous, from metamorphic and within metamorphic titanite between different grades. This is going to be very difficult because titanite chemistry is more complex than rutiles. So here I just uh, illustrated some of the most recent uh, discrimination diagrams using trace elements applied to rutile, uh, titanite. Sorry. So here for igneous, where we can try to discriminate sanukitide related from TTG related titanite, and here. Uh, very, very nice work that has been, uh, uh, Elizabeth Sibiorski has been leading. So this one published in 2021 or 2019, where she tried to uh, look systematically at the trace element composition of titanite grains and try to discriminate these different source types. So for instance, in this diagram, by using the sum of light rare earth elements and the ratio of aluminum and iron, she comes up to a quite nice discrimination of igneous and metamorphic titanite. While here she uses the ratio between dysprosium and ytterbium to try to uh, discriminate uh, titanite that has grew in a garnet free assemblage from one in a garnet bearing assemblage. And by systematically applying this uh, type of approach, we might be able to slowly be able to discriminate uh, titanite growth conditions in metamorphic rocks. So also during uh, my postdoc time, I've tried to look at uh, some of these trace element systematics, but focusing on metamorphic rocks. So I mostly worked with metagabros and some metabasalts, and some had rutile, some had titanite. And I tried to uh, look at the trace element distribution within uh, these different uh, rocks that were formed at different grades. So we had uh, low pressure IODP metagabros, and we have ecogite uh, metagabros, and titanite the same. And so uh, however robust these may be, so for metamorphic only, so for metamorphic only rutiles, what we see is that uh, niobium and vanadium may be able to discriminate quite well rutile grains that are formed at low pressure conditions from those that are, are stable in ecogite fascist conditions. So the ratio of niobium and vanadium of about, in this case, 0 0.3, seems to nicely discriminate these different rutiles. While for titanite, so we've done similarly, we just look first at uh, metamorphic rocks, but then we try to incorporate titanite data from the literatures, from the literature, so from uh, different types of magmatic rocks, from uh, high temperature metamorphic rocks such as cox silicates, orthognizes, etc., and some other blue schist uh, derived titanites. And uh, trying different combinations, again, what we see is that meobium uh, tantalum and uh, heavy rare earths in titanite then can split titanites that are formed at medium temperature, low pressure conditions from those formed at low temperature, high pressure conditions. But when we plot other type of titanite, then things start to become a bit mixed up. Otherwise, this ternary of vanadium, the ratio of lanthanum, samarium, and the heavy rare earths, they can do a better job at discriminate this all other type of titanite uh, grains from titanite from high pressure, low temperature, so pretty much blue schist, low temperature ecogite conditions. So there might be some mixing, but so far this is the best uh, we have come up with to try to single out some titanite from the rest of titanite types. 
So I guess now um, what's next for Titanite is try to um, see how robust this discrimination is against other uh, Titanites found in other metamorphic rocks and then try to see if we can apply to the Drytal Titanite uh, context. We haven't done that so far. So for the end of my talk, I just brought a little bit about the Drytal Ruta. So when we look at the age of Ruta, we can say something about uh, provenance. So if we have some sediments and we have a range of ages from 200, 250, then 600, then 1,000 million years old, we can say something about the source area. There are rocks with those ages and with metamorphism at that time. When I start, uh, start working with the trital rutile, I start realizing that there was something interesting about uh, the distribution of rutile ages in sediment or sedimentary rocks. So here uh, I'm just showing a sketch where we have all these different tectonic settings. And this is just illustrative of what we can uh, already see just looking at the age distribution of rutile. For instance, of course, even though not much rutile uh, is exposed in uh, convergent basins, we see that usually rutile ages are skewed close to the deposition age, and we don't usually have inherited ages in these sort of basins. While in collisional type basins, we actually see, okay, a main peak that provides constraints from the last main uh, metamorphic event that is ongoing. But usually there are also some inherited ages. And this is more true if we uh, have a piece of this uh, foreland basin that recorded still the ongoing event before the main collisional event. And then if we look at rift or passive margin sedimentary rocks, what usually happens is that there is a lag between the deposition age and the first uh, rutile age that we have. And so this inspired uh, trying to see if we can find a good tool to use these ages and try to say something about the tectonic setting during a uh, deposition. And this was mostly inspired by this paper by Peter Kaywood and co-authors that was published in uh, 2012 in Geology, where they used the cumulative proportion of the trital zircon against the crystallization age, so the zircon age subtracted the deposition age. And if you have distributions that fall on this side, you are in a convergent basin. If they fall on this blue part of the diagram, in a collisional setting, or if you fall on the this side, the green part, you're in an extensional setting. But what the literature has showed uh, up to that moment, and that we illustrate here, is that occasionally this sort of discri discrimination doesn't stand. So here I use two examples. So one from uh, sediments from a back arc basin, and in gray, we have the detrital zircon uh, distribution. And the detrital zircon distribution, using uh, this discrimination provided by uh, Kaywood, um, they, would be, uh, they would lead to interpret it as a collisional type basin while it is convergent. Otherwise, the distribution of rutile, the detrital rutile here in red shows that actually the trital rutile uh, provides a much more uh, much more confidence in this discrimination. And we did the same for another uh, sedimentary sequence that was formed as a foreland basin. And you see that the detrital zircon cumulative proportion distribution follows that of a typical extensional basins, while rutile is actually following more of what is expected in a foreland basin. So we seem more robust. So we look at all the available detrital rutile ages out there and the ones that also had well-constrained deposition ages. And we try to systematize uh, the data. So here for extensional settings, rift to passive margin, we have the cumulative proportion 
and again the growth age minus deposition age. So we did that for the extensional settings and we see that typically the curves are like sigmoid. So this represents that we have uh, almost no ages and then we have a main metamorphic event. Here, this, this data, I really like this data. So this data comes from this paper, Avigad published in 2017. And so this data illustrates quite well is that, of course, after we formed Gondwana, then we rifted. And we rifted in some areas very close to where we had the, the, um, the suture. And so what happens is that because this uh, reopening was followed very quickly, the closure, we have some detrital distribution ages that are very similar to, to what we could be interpreted as a convergent or collisional uh, curve. But if we follow the sequence from bottom up, we see that the curve of the trital root edge distribution changes. And so this illustrates very nicely that if we sample a sequence bottom up, three, four samples, we can uh, be very certain of uh, the interpretation we make uh, using uh, the trito root ages. And then we did the same for uh, collisional type settings. And unlike extensional that had a typical S curve, these uh, are usually R curves. So they are very steep because most of the root ages ages, uh, they are growing together as they are uh, reaching the basin. Okay, finally, I'm getting to the last part of this talk. Unfortunately, occasionally, we would like to go sample our uh, meta sandstones and have beautiful detrital grains. Unfortunately, sometimes this is not the case because some detrital grains have been disturbed. So this is what happened when uh, I went to sample the weather formation. So here uh, we have Brazil the San Francisco Craton, the southern portion of the Craton. Mm. And we have the typical dome and kill structure, where in the kill of this Archean basement, we have a late Archean, early Paleoproterozoic sequence, the minor supergroup. And at the bottom of this group, we have uh, the Moeda formation, which is uh, siliciclastic. It has conglomerates in uh, the bottom and uh, they are gold bearing. So at the bottom, so there is this uh, shear zone. So uh, most of the conglomerates, they are sheared. And then on the top, as we uh, go uh, further away from the shear zone, what we have actually is um, a, a sandstone, almost uh, no metamorphism, but we can see evidence of fluid circulation, either uh, ferruginous or uh, rich in um, chromium. So when we start looking at and imaging these uh, detrital root algal grains, we start seeing very funky textures with patchy zoning that already pointed out that we have complex chemistry. And these very funky uh, mineral inclusions, some of them were maybe primary, most of them were secondary. And there are a bunch of different uh, sulfides, sulfur salts, um, that already were giving us hints that something very wonky had happened there. So we decided to uh, do high resolution EPMA uh, maps of the some of these uh, grains. So here we have a BSE image, and we can see some linear features. We can see it's very patchy. And then we decided to look at uh, the most important trace elements in root tiles, so iron, chromium, niobium. And you can see, looking at the scale, that the variations in these grains, they range in the thousands of ppm in these, in these elements. Here, for instance, in the niobium, we go from areas in red that are about 6,000 ppm to areas in blue that are uh, below detection limit, which was about 300 or 400 ppm. 
So I was um, hindered by this sort of process, how we end up having these complex rutile grains. So we decided to do EBSD, so backscatter diffraction on these grains. So here we have a FSD image that already tell us that we have a texturally different rutile that is aggregated. And here we have an IPF uh, pole figure, reverse pole figure uh, map of the same grain. And without uh, great complications, the colors just tell us that these grains have very different orientations. Now, if we try to combine the, these different orientations with the chemistry, we can try to uh, learn something about the what happened to these rutile grains. But before we did that, we just wanted to see if these high and low niobium uh, concentration areas had systematic uh, variations in either tungsten or zirconium. Tungsten, because it, it's a tracer of rutile form uh, with gold, and zirconium because of the thermometer. And what systematically we see is that higher niobium domains correspond to higher uh, tungsten and zirconium concentrations, and the low niobium domains to below detection limit or very low zirconium and tungsten concentrations. So in this way, uh, of course, niobium is very immobile. And so if we have a grain that somehow is being dissolved, domains that still preserve the highest niobium concentrations are probably relict parts of these rutile grains. And so what we, we did, we plot different data from uh, several different grains, and we were able to quite nicely split minimum peak conditions using the niobium-rich domains and maximum overgrowth conditions using the low niobium domains. And this uh, estimate, so under or at about 340 degrees, is, um, is in a good agreement with the metamorphic conditions of these metasandstones, while minimum conditions of 600 degrees agrees well with metamorphism of the Archean basement. So uh, while complex, we were able to say something about the uh, thermal evolution of these grains. So our interpretation is that in the, in the weather basin, we had detrital rutal coming together with some detrital sulfites and gold. Then uh, during later orogenic events, we had fluid circulating. This fluid must have had complex chemistry that accelerated uh, rutile dissolution. So here we start dissolving and altering these uh, earlier detrital rutile grains, and we start growing uh, phyllosilicates and some uh, forming some sulfur salts. And at the end, when everything comes together, we have a relict rutile grains that are surrounded by partially dissolved or altered rutile grains, and they are overgrown by new rutile, because of course, if we are dissolving titanium, titanium is quite immobile, so we will tend to reprecipitate nearby. And so we end up having a patch of uh, rutile in each of these uh, detrital rutile grains. And this explained why uh, this was probably one of the most challenging uh, uranium-led data sets that I ever dealt with. There was a lot of different things going on from uh, lead loss to common lead, because of course, if we put a spot on these grains, we will ablate uh, diff different types of rutile. So this, this is one of the reasons that when we are dealing with the trital rutile, we need to make sure that we don't choose uh, a meta sandstone that has endure high metamorphic, so no higher than biotite zone, and definitely no fluid interaction, or else we might end up with a very complicated uranium-led and trace element data set. So take home messages. 
in order to uh, establish a good proxy to track metamorphic conditions over time, what do we need? We need a mineral that is uh, ubiquitous in metamorphic rocks and that can record different parts of the PT, but is also fine, found as a detrital mineral. We need to be able to do uranium lead dating to determine the age of growth. And we need to be able to separate if it's metamorphic from igneous, but also uh, it would be nice if we have some sort of uh, information if it grew at eclogite or at granulite conditions. So rutile and titanite, they are stable in this wide range of PT conditions, including low and high uh, TP. Titanite is more stable than rutile at bushes, fascist conditions for all the different compositions. But rutile uh, that is grown at 550, 600 or lower is more stable at more than 13 kilobars. And it will be so with decreasing temperature. So for sure, rutile that yields temperatures under 550, it's coming from high pressure conditions. And um, we can probe the metamorphic uh, record using the trital minerals such as rutile, but I told you about limitations that apply. So we are really, we estimate a stability of rutile, but we are not sure about this pressure uh, assumption. We use discriminational tools that are at fault. And we know that rutile is not the most common mineral in blue schist fascist conditions. So by using the trital rutile, we are probably missing uh, part of the record nonetheless. The trital rutile age cumulative distributions can be used to discriminate different tectonic settings. Um, and this is probably more useful to Precambrian geology when there is some deformation, we've lost uh, some of uh, the criteria that we can use for more modern sedimentology. And finally, I show that uh, the trital rutile, however robust it usually is uh, during uh, diagenesis and uh, low-grade metamorphism, it can still be uh, affected and disturbed by uh, fluids um, and uh, suffer dissolution reprecipitation processes, even at very low temperatures. And this is all I had to uh, discuss with you or that I brought to discuss with you today. Thank you so much, Ines. It was such an amazing talk. You are doing a great job in different uh, sectors to come with these uh, geotectonic interpretations. This is quite amazing. Congratulations for your work. Oh, thank you. I guess a bit full on, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I hope that, that I paced nice. myself enough to for you to follow. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Uh, Ines, also to give you uh, some time to breathe and drink some water, we will take a short time to advertise our uh, special publication that Excellent. we are heading. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, I will uh, take just a few minutes. Uh, and we, I think, are on a perfect note considering this amazing presentation that Ines gave on uh, uh, Tatanite and Rutel in a different bunch of uh, rock types and tectonic environments. So our uh, special publication is on the Geological Society of London, is a um, publication that was uh, actually was born from uh, a, a, Goldsch a Goldsmith, Goldschmidt session uh, that we had last year um, and that we convened uh, myself, Ines, and Maira, together with also Catherine Katz, uh, Martin Guitro, and um, Valby van Schindel. So, us, we will also um, um, be um, um, uh, uh, organizing this special uh, publication that welcomes uh, the use of uh, accessory, mean, uh, accessory and key minerals in general. Um, uh, to unravel formation and the evolution of the Earth's crust. So the, this will uh, bring um, uh, the contribution on, um, on the use of metamorphic, magmatic, and the trital uh, key minerals um, in a, different, uh, uh, um, a bunch of different uh, analytical studies and experimental studies, as Ines showed us today. Um, so if you um, have any 
uh, contribution that you think that could fit in our special publication, please don't hesitate to contact us um, and um, we can give you then more information. Uh, the probably most important information now is that the deadline is uh, the beginning of May uh, of 2022. Um, so yeah, this is all. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Ines. Yeah. So Ines, we have a bunch of comments congratulating you for your talk. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have from Gilberto for the presentation. You rock, Ines. I agree. <laughs> Great talk. I know George is uh, uh, enthusiastic of uh, root tile investigation as well. So he said, I just love the root tile scarf. Looks <laughs> just like the last, last picture of root tile. <laughs> and, uh, Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ines. Uh, uh, th there, is, there are some comments here in the and the, and the questions, I put yeah. the, the question about Pahoti. Mm -hmm. he, he asks, uh, did, did she use PCA? Ah, no, no, just, just there one. There is one before. Uh, mm -hmm. This someone working on PCA for trace elements in, in, in Titanite. And uh, Nikki Roberts comments, then this Ice Bjors just published that in Terra Nova, Exactly, <laughs> exactly my answer. <laughs> She's been doing a wonderful job uh, looking at systematics of uh, titanite, uh, trace elements in titanite. Uh, but we also did that for our data set. Of course, uh, this was mostly based on uh, metamorphic uh, titanite. Uh, so we applied that to our data set and then using the discrimination, we plot the literature data. So we did not do PCA for everything out there. Uh, we just applied it first to our data set and then we compared it with the literature. Uh, well, Elizabeth, she's been doing a much more heavy lifting work, I would say. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Ines, I have myself a question. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing the interpretations that you got from your work with the root tile. Uh, for for low temperature metamorphism is particularly something I'm interested into, and I was wondering if I mean I know you have compiled a lot of data, but if you have tried in your own data to retrieve the metamorph conditions through inclusions, especially for titanite, because you said it's quite difficult to get from trace elements. Yeah, definitely. So uh, there was. Um, uh, work published by Emma Hart in 2016, well, where she clearly demonstrated that for rutile we can use mineral inclusions and by use, applying PT uh, to the, those inclusions, we can retrieve the exact same PT conditions as matrix uh, minerals. Mm -hmm. So this is actually very nicely done and inspiring. But then as we start looking at the detrital data sets, unfortunately, I would say that less than 5% detrital root tiles have inclusions. Mm -hmm. So I guess that there is still a big unknown of what controls entrapment of minerals in root tile. Mm -hmm. So I guess this has to be addressed first. Because yes, ideally what we would like to do, both for titanite and root tile, is that we use the zirconium thermometry and then we use mineral inclusions to try to better estimate pressures. Mm -hmm. Then a second issue, I guess, is that in ideal world, we would have two, three inclusions that allow you very nice uh, PT constraints. Uh, but usually this is not the case. So you might end up with, uh, okay, an amphibole or a biotite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you can use it to reassure you maybe about, oh, maybe this is from a metapilite or a metamorphic rock, but uh, it's not so straightforward as we would wish. Okay, yeah. I was also very fascinated by uh, Emma's heart. Uh, Thank you very much. But I, I agree with you for my samples. I didn't have such a so many nice inclusions, inclusions. in my tile so far as well. So yeah, 
It makes me want to cry. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't cry. You're doing an amazing job. Don't worry. It's quite nice what you got with the trace elements as well. Yeah. Yeah, but let's say that, and I I appreciate the criticism that it's not very precise uh, science because you know metamorphic rocks are complex. Chemistry of metamorphic rocks is complex, so a lot of interpretation goes into these trace element based discrimination diagrams. And I understand that people wish for more robust uh, data, but I guess we can do what we can do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, of course, it's already difficult to reconstruct metamorphic history of rocks. Imagine after adding the trito cycle to that. Of so, course. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So I have a, a curiosity as well. In those experiments that you did, mm -hmm. did you ever? Uh, I did. I didn't. I don't remember if you show in those uh, in those images if there were any like key inclusions within those rutels that formed um, during your experiments? Inclusions? Within the rutile. No, so in the in the experiments, usually uh, I, I start with titanite seeds mostly. Yeah. And what we have seen is that occasionally we do have dissolution of the titanite seeds and we grow either rutile or iron oxide. But usually when we grow the root tiles, they are nice, nicely grown. They're mm. quite okay. perfect, bladed, so yeah. uh, n no inclusions. No inclusions, okay, okay. Um, and then I actually have a question about um, when you talked about um, um, so your titanite and root tile compilation and how that is related to um, uh, supercontinent cycle, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then Obviously, for um, the Paleoproterozoic or you know mm -hmm. the, the Nuna or any way even actually before Nuna um, a rock record or mineral record, yeah. um, there obviously that shows um, a smaller uh, uh, an inexistent skew towards let's say that uh, lower uh, temperature part. Yeah. Um, so my question would be, and you say then you know probably is more interesting to look into titanite at lower uh, temperature condition. And in that case, uh, so two question. First, like where where would you think like would be like the best, let's say candidate to look into um, <laughs> because of um, lack maybe of, of blue schist, for example. So what what are your thoughts about that? The where, right? It's not the <laughs> first time people have asked me that. <laughs> and uh, I guess it's difficult to say, like, um, I guess uh, East Laurentia terrains, uh, I guess not so much for prior, even though it could be, for instance, <clears throat> my uh, I work in the Torridon, in the Torridon mm -hmm. uh, in Northwest Scotland. And we have uh, over there, we can, have a nice spread of all paleoproterozoic uh, brutal ages, so why not also titanite ages, I guess? And there is also Archean derived uh, rocks there, mm -hmm. so we see that um, quite well. Uh, and then on top of the Torridon, there is the Artvec group, which is Cambrian in age, and that one we, we were able to date uh, Archean age uh, rutile, so. Mm -hmm. I guess it could be good to try to continue in this area, try to, uh, I guess, look at sedimentary rocks that have a clear uh, Archean detrital signature from yeah. Zarkin, maybe if already other accessory mineral as well. And then uh, try to systematically look at uh, the detrital rutal and titanite. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for titanite because uh, I don't know that many uh, uh, meta sedimentary rocks of uh, let's say latest uh, latest Archean uh, or older that are not uh, metamorphosed to a degree where you completely erase uh, titanite. Um, so this is one of the big challenges. Uh, while for yeah. rutile, I guess you can be lucky. There are some, I think, some basins also in Australia that could be targeted. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Rosal did some did some uh, retali they tried to retaliate PV dating as well. Uh, but I still think, yeah, uh, related to the Granville or all the metamorphic events that led to the Granville, all these uh, East Laurentia terrains are probably good. Because mm -hmm. I guess, uh, Sylvia, of course, when did plate tectonics start is one of the questions. But one of the main criticisms about the establishment of plate tectonics since the Paleoproterozoic is this lack of cold subduction during the Mesoproterozoic. So I would say, let's cover that first, which probably yeah. is easier. Mm -hmm. Try to find this signal then, and then we yeah. worry about uh, the oldest evidence. Yeah, I'd say probably that's the the best approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have another comment, another question here. The Peter Barrot again, uh, Ines, in the con complete that, that, that data of your own data, do you discern between root tile and the other oxido, the titanium phases? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do the trace elements also provide some unstable information? Yeah, I guess this is following uh, Australian uh, people work <laughs> that they use trace elements uh, to discriminate between rutile, uh, bruca, etanates, uh, polymorphs. Uh, so um, most of the data I published from my PhD, uh, we had an EBSD in our SEM. So all of the data I collected, I knew they were from rutile because I, I checked which polymorph it was. While well, here we've done that with Raman, so most of the data I have, yeah, most if not all, they are rutal. I haven't found the anatas or a brookite. <laughs> hmm. So Ines, I, I was also very interested when you showed the application of the tectonic setting discrimination diagrams for rutile because I'm also uh, particularly interested on that. Um, regarding zircon and the mm -hmm. possible disturbing of uh, these interpretations um, yeah. in, um, in result of the ultra high temperature metamorphism. And then after that, you have shown uh, that uh, we have to use uh, rutile dating with careful, especially if it's high grade and yeah. uh, with the fluids and i was wondering have you tried to use this data set that you already know that it's disturbed to apply into this discrimination diagrams to evaluate how much problem that could cause because then we know the the, mm -hmm. the, the tectonic setting and so on yeah i guess um i did use some detrital retail from the sabara Mm -hmm. So, of course, then the context is no longer the same as the weather, right? Because we mm -hmm. have already a collisional setting. And so what I see, there is important lead loss, mm -hmm. right? There is an important lead loss. Uh, we see that very well in those, uh, the, the trital rutal data set. But of course, then either you you try to use the 207, 206 age, and you use that to plot in the cumulative distribution uh, diagrams. And by doing so, it does plot in the field of uh, collisional foreland uh, basin. Mm -hmm. So it does work for the weather. I'll tell you, I did not try because the UPB is so, so disturbed that mm -hmm. we end up having maybe 10, 10 good ages. Mm -hmm. So we cannot really do cumulative distribution uh, yeah. plots with 10 ages. Mm -hmm. So I actually did not do that. But okay. so maybe I was unlucky enough that what we sampled was really affected by these, by these fluids, by this fluid event. But uh, you can definitely go further <laughs> and try to avoid uh, these fluid interaction zones and probably would be able to have more grains that have not been so disturbed. Yeah. Thank you, Ines. 
So uh, we have also a comment from Dina. Uh, she said, really nice talk and subject, Ines. And, Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, people really enjoyed your talk. It was, again, I repeat, really nice, Ines. Thank you so much for coming and, and presenting um to us and i would also like to thank you uh sylvia for joining us today and all the petrochronic team that is in the backstage organizing the talks and the posts and mariana so that's it thank you so much Ines, and see you soon hopefully thank you so much for inviting me it's lovely to see you and to be part of your wonderful uh, petrochronic series <laughs> and all the best for you as well Thanks. Thanks, Inés. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. ciao. Bye. Ciao.